Well, hello there from beautiful and bustling Budladek First Nation. This is Telil 24-7, and I'm your host, Adam Cook. In just a few moments, I'm going to speak to one of the key organizers for the Mi'kmaq Summer Games, which are beginning in Budladek next week. And you'll also see a preview of another big Richmond County event that is returning this summer after two years of pandemic shutdowns, Swim the Canal in St. Peter's. And you'll also hear from Kali Kehoe, an Isle Madame native who is now campaigning against litter in her former home and in Richmond County overall. But we begin with a look at the Mi'kmaq Summer Games. They're coming to Budladek after various delays prevented the event from happening here over the past two years. But now this part of Richmond County is ready to welcome hundreds of athletes, coaches, and other participants from all the way across the Maritimes. And we're excited to speak to one of the key people who are on the ground floor right now looking after all of that, Isaiah Bernard. Here's my chat with Isaiah right now. We're here with the head coordinator of the Mi'kmaq Summer Games, Isaiah Bernard. Isaiah, you're from Budladek yourself, but I understand that getting this position almost caught you by surprise when it first came up back in the fall. Tell me a little bit about how you came to be in charge of this massive event right now. Uh, it's kind of a funny story because I wasn't uh, when the, when the job post first happened, I didn't want to, I didn't want to apply for it, and then uh, I just seen it again. I was like, you know what? Maybe this is a sign for me to do it. And I spoke, I spoke, uh, spoke around, and I asked, I, I asked my grandmother, and I, asked, she said, uh, if the, if this, if that's what you think you're doing, that's what the creator's trying to tell you what to do. So I applied for it, not thinking I'd get it. The next thing you know, uh, about a month later, I, I get told I got the, I got the job. Well, Isaiah, we're less than a week away from the start of the Mi'kmaq Summer Games here in Budladek. The opening ceremonies get going this Sunday night. How do you feel being this close to launch day? Surreal. Uh, I was hired back in November, and that's, it feels like last month was November, and here we are in uh, July. So what are some of the last things you have to cross off your list here in Budladek before things get underway? Well, uh, we're getting our lights uh, finally installed. <laughs> like uh, They're supposed to be done like last month, but uh, it is what it is. Unfortunately, June wasn't kind to us with the weather, so we're getting that done uh, like today, or this week actually. And well, that's often how it goes. You have to work till the end to get things tightened up. Yeah, I've uh, thankfully Nova Scotia Power is uh, helping us out with make, making things faster and expediting everything for us. So where are people coming from to help with these preparations, Isaiah? How far afield have people traveled to be here putting this all together? Well, I noticed people come from Gascabega, Quebec, uh, Lissagouche. Uh, I noticed usually we get some people from New Brunswick, but I haven't seen much. Uh, I haven't seen any in the, our files yet, but. Doesn't mean they usually come like last minute. So it always is. Well, this year's Mi'kmaq Summer Games get underway here in Budladek with the opening ceremonies coming up this Sunday evening. What can you tell me about the people and experiences that those attending the opening ceremonies are going to see, Isaiah? Well, we're going to see, uh, start off, we're going to see like a grand entry, like the all communities come in. We try to help the crowd out like for the for rest of the week. Uh, to my knowledge, we have MK has come down to do a, uh, I forgot the exact word, but they have a MK is doing a presentation as well. On top of that, we have a, I call it a super secret presentation, but that's what we're going to leave it as right there. It's a okay. super secret presentation happened on uh, Sunday, uh, July 17th. And then uh, I think that pretty much sums it up. Just going to try to hype the crowd out, just to tell them how excited we are to finally see them all bunched up together for the first time in since 2019. And this is going to be very significant for Budladek First Nation because your community was supposed to host these games just a couple of years ago, but we all know what's been happening for the last couple of years. So can you tell me a little bit about the spirit in the community right now, knowing that the games have finally come to Budladek? I think it means for us is like uh, we're here, like uh, no, nothing can conquer our, our spirit. Like we're the, we're, it is, we're in, we're in Mi'kmaq, home of the Mi'kmaq, like the, if nothing's gonna like stop us from doing what uh, doing what we love, and then these these sports are a part of our is now a part of our culture. It's like because of this, like we get to uh, we can we can learn from each other, help each other. So, what are some of the sports we're going to see in the competitions for this year's Mi'kmaq Summer Games, Isaiah? Well, there's gonna be uh, grappling, my 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 personal favorite. There's gonna be uh, the traditional quadrathlon. Uh, that's probably the one I put the most work in uh, myself physically because we had to clear a kilometer of brush for it. 
Uh, we also got the softball going on here at this at our beautiful fields here. Uh, it's probably the and then we got the 5K race as well, and we got the team sports like volleyball, uh, basketball, as well. And I understand there's some aquatic events going on in Port Hawkesbury as well. Yes, so uh, we we have pool, we have a uh, swimming going on at, at Sarek uh, that the town of Port Hawkesbury is so graciously, uh, graciously, I think that's the word. They're they're like, thankful, like letting us uh, use their uh, facilities. We also got the uh, using dualies as well in uh, Port Hawkesbury as well. So they've been they've been really helpful with us, and like they're they've been so excited ever since since uh, I called them back in November because. They're they're happy to see the summer games are coming back, and then uh, we got the lakes at the Benyon uh, to use as golf as well. And I understand East Richmond Education Center in St. Peter's is going to be open for some of the competition. Can you tell me what's happening over at the St. Peter's school? So happening at the St. Peter's uh, school, uh, East Richmond is basketball for like I forgot what days exactly, and then we also have track and field there because our track field is just all rocky. And I know we've got hundreds of people coming from all around the Maritimes and even Quebec to take part in these games. Can you tell me where the participants are coming from, Isaiah? All, all of Mi'kma all of Mi'kmaq for sure. All thirteen reserves here. Uh, two in Quebec. I think I got one. I think I do got a couple people coming from uh, Eel River Bar. I think I think it is. Isaiah Bernard, this is home for you. You grew up in Budladek, so what does it mean to be working with the community to bring these Mi'kmaq summer games back home? Uh, it's weird because like uh, everyone's come together for the summer games. It's, uh, we had a huge community support uh, ever since we announced it. Like the last few months have been like uh, I've been getting like, questions left and right. If you need me, I can help you do this. You can do this. Do this. So it feels really nice. I got the. My my uh, my uh, my chief and my council have been helpful like within the last like as well. They've given me every every single help that I need, which is awesome and uh, it's like really awesome. It's really surreal, I would say, like really good. You mentioned just a moment ago that you were a competitor in the Mi'kmaq Summer Games in the grappling events when you were younger. How does it feel to look back on those experiences now? Uh well, I've competed though. I competed like in the war like. As far as New York, I've, I've no, actually, no. As far as uh, London, actually. Uh, so training here, competing here is different because I get to compete in front of my friends and family. But it's not like the, so it's a lot. It's similar pressure because you gotta live up to like the hype that people had behind you. So, but it's also nice where like last night, last summer games here in 2014, I got to compete and, I, and after that I got to go right back right to my home and. Uh, just relax instead of uh, staying at a hotel. It's pretty cool because before summer games, there was little, there was very little the community to community, uh, like uh, I guess mingle, mingling, I guess. So with the with the games, it helps like introduces like kids from other reserves to kids from different reserves and uh, make friends and like because of the games now, there's people who have friends like from here to uh, I guess Quebec to uh, to. To uh, all across Escazoni, uh, Member Two, Wamukok, Wagoma, all, all the reserves. And that's what the games were all about. It's, just, it's for the kids to uh, make friends. In addition to the pandemic, of course, the last couple of years have been very difficult for the Mi'kmaq community and their allies because of the discoveries made at residential schools all across Canada. Do you feel that the return of the Mi'kmaq Summer Games to Budladek and the gathering of the community together will help provide some healing after these difficult past two years? Yeah, exactly. That's the that's best, best, best way to put it is the time of healing, time of uh, time to get together, especially the last two years. I mean... I, my grandmother lives down the road, and I couldn't visit her. It uh, it sucked because my brothers my brothers lived there, but I wasn't allowed in because of the, because of the strict rules we had. And uh, but now we, we're we're all together, so we're excited to uh, be together. And uh, with all because we have all I have a lot of family coming down just for the summer games, just to like we can uh, all like hang out. And uh, well, unfortunately, I won't be able to because I'm gonna be going around and like. But I'll get some time to hang out with my family at least. I'm happy with that. We've covered a lot of ground in a short time, Isaiah. Is there anything else you'd like to add about the Mi'kmaq Summer Games just before we wrap up? We're excited. We're excited to have the games finally and uh, get the ball, get the ball rolling. And help. Hopefully, we we'll keep these going every year from now on. I mean, three years, 
no games here we are when we announced the games back in november everyone said oh you're going to cancel again you're going to cancel again and then uh i uh when covid got bad back in january everyone thought we we're going to cancel and i was and i just said we're not going to cancel but we're, we're in this we're in this until the end and uh fortunately the cases are kind of down now so we're hope we're, we're happy like we held we held off and told the hitting the c button but yeah we know this is a busy time and we really appreciate you giving us a couple of minutes to tell us about the big Ma summer games isaiah bernard thank you for joining me today on tell ill 24 7. Well, I'll go. stay tuned to tell ill 24 7 because in just a few minutes time i have a preview of another richmond county summer event that's returning after a lengthy absence swim the canal in st peter's but right now, let's turn our attention to the problem of littering and illegal dumping in Richmond County. A former Isle Madame resident has taken it upon herself to get people talking about this issue. She's reached out to three levels of government and she launched a petition about the issue on change.org just a few months back. Her name is Callie Kehoe. I got the chance to interview her at her office at the Auditor General's office in Ottawa. Here is our interview right now about the littering problem in Richmond County. And now joining us from her office in Ottawa, we're pleased to have a former Isle Madame resident who's taken up the fight against litter back in her home province and her home county. We're pleased to welcome Callie Kehoe to Telil 24-7. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Adam, for having me. It's good to have you, and you caught our attention with a number of different measures that you've taken against littering, against dumping in Isle Madame. Can you give me a sense on how this all started and what finally flicked the switch for you to take serious action against this? Yeah, sure. Um, for the last few years, uh, I've been living out of, uh, off of Isle Madame in Halifax, and then I recently moved to Ottawa. And I've been returning home and noticing my eyes opened about all the litter on the side of the road. And there's been years where my sister and I would be driving on the road and we would see huge garbage bags of garbage. And it's been something that's caught my attention and made me fairly upset over time. And I've talked to a lot of people in my community about it. And I noticed that a lot of folks had similar issues and were similarly upset about it. Um, I think that my idea to put a petition together was really probably stemming from my job now with the Office of the Auditor General. Um, I noticed that, you know, there is an impact in getting people together and voicing concerns to members of uh, Parliament and members of our um, councils and whatnot. And so I thought that if nobody else was going to take the opportunity to do it, that I may as well kickstart it and then others can join in and uh, raise their voice about it too. Now, you grew up in the Rocky Bay, Pondville area, as you've mentioned. So has this always been a problem? Have you noticed this even as a child that you've seen uh, littering happening in those areas or in general different parts of Isle Madame? Uh, I'll be honest with you. I don't know that I fully recognized it growing up. You know, I was going to school and I was playing with my friends and things like that. So I don't think that it was really top of mind. But I think now upon you know leaving and then coming back to it and really soaking up the the beauty that is my hometown I think that that's where it really started to sink in for me that this was a problem and that it was it seemed very like a really huge problem to me just recently over these last few years mm -hmm. yeah. what do you think is the bigger concern right now and I imagine perhaps they go hand in hand you mentioned entire garbage bags just being left on the side of the road littering has been an issue in different parts of Richmond County for quite a while uh, and illegal dumping has been a problem for quite a while too just basically out of the way places where entire pieces of furniture or large garbage bags have been a problem uh, are you seeing all of this when you come home or has it just basically been one or the other or what are your thoughts so I myself have only seen the like small litter on the side of the roads and the garbage bags on the side of the roads. However, a close friend of mine has noticed, in fact, in the graveyard behind uh, formerly St. Hyacinth's uh, church, that there has been heavy dumping there. So I haven't so seen that with my own eyes, but I have heard reports of it from folks in my community. 
Mm -hmm. And there is anecdotal evidence as well that it's been in different parts of Richmond County as well, too. And that's a problem going back years as well. Mm -hmm. So with all of this going on, Callie, you decided to do something about it. And I know you put a petition up on change.org just a few months ago. How has that petition campaign gone? What's the response been like for that? Yeah, it's been really good. I was surprised. I decided to launch it on change.org because this is a this is a portal that I've used to sign petitions in the past. And I do think that today doing things electronically are probably the easiest way to get uptake from folks. Mm. And so I had um, launched it fairly early in May and had reached out to some friends and family to post on Facebook, the link to the petition. And, you know, I had a steady income of support over you know, a month and a half or so I kept it open for, I ended up having 149 petition signatures, including myself, which I think in a small community like on the dam is really, really powerful. Sometimes just a few dozen or even just over 100 signatures can be a powerful voice uh, when you're in a small community, as you say. So glad to see you got that response. So you've taken your campaign now to the three levels of government, to the municipal, provincial, and federal government. I want to start with the municipal government because your request to Richmond Municipal Council sparked a lengthy conversation about various ways to be able to deal with littering around the county, everything from putting up extra garbage bins to having more waste receptacles just on the main streets uh, in different parts of Richmond County. What are your thoughts on the response you've gotten from the municipality thus far? So I'm really happy. I'll, I'll premise this by saying that I did my research mainly because working for the Office of the Auditor General and then also within my master's degree, I learned that providing evidence to folks so that they can actually see their role and their responsibility that they have in matters really helps to make movement and create change within those organizations. Mm -hmm. So to start with uh, the municipal level, I, in fact, did receive feedback from our um, warden of Richmond County, Amanda Mummerkat, and she had said that she was going to be speaking with the CEO and then later responded back, CAO, sorry, and later responded back that they were actually going to keep this top of mind at the municipal level and that they were going to uh, discuss it at committee and then also look at maybe um, referring the matter to the police advisory committee. So, you know, I think that seeing that tangible evidence that they are thinking about this and that they're actually looking for ways to create solutions and to potentially even um, create more awareness in the community. Cause she also mentioned something about um, creating more educational opportunities. So I think that that really made me happy and made me feel like this petition had some value to it. I know there was some concern at the council level at the latest regular meeting that because Richmond doesn't have a regular bylaw enforcement officer to be able to punish people for things like this or offer them fines or warnings, that it's difficult for them. But do you feel that they're looking beyond that and they're looking for creative ways to be able to address the problem? Yeah, I got the idea that, you know, there are these issues that are faced that make it challenging to enforce these sort of things. But I did gather from Amanda's response that they are trying to think of ways around that and ways that they might still be able to make some change with this issue. Um, I haven't heard back from Amanda about what's come up since then, but I did ask her to stay in touch with me and keep me posted so that I could share that with my petitioners as well. All right, well, we'll hope for some further developments there. So you've also reached out to the province of Nova Scotia and to the government of Canada. Can you tell me a little bit about who you've connected with in the, that regard and whether you've been getting responses from the provincial and federal levels as well as the municipal? So at the provincial level, as uh, in my letter, I identified that there are areas underneath the Environmental Act that would allow them to have some jurisdiction over this litter issue. And so I specifically reached out to MLA Boudreaux and um, asked them to work with the uh, municipality in order to amplify the amount of support that might be for this issue. I have not heard back yet, um, though I'm still hopeful that, you know, it's only been about, you know, a few weeks. So hopefully I'll hear back at some point. Um, at the federal level, I reached out to MP Calloway. And in fact, he did respond within a few days time, which I thought was really great. 
Um, he pointed me toward the new uh, ban on single-use plastics that's going to be coming out at the end of the year, December 2022. And he was hopeful that that might have some sort of impact on reducing the amount of litter that might be possible in the environment. And so I was really grateful to hear back from him as well. Now, you mentioned just a moment ago as well, in terms of your response from MP Mike Kellaway, uh, him talking about Canada's upcoming ban on single-use plastics. Do you feel that national bans such as this are going to help the problem as well? Uh, you know, is it going to be a matter that this is going to play a role or do you think this is only one part of the overall puzzle? Yeah, it's certainly one part of the puzzle and I don't want to discount this ban because I do think it's so great. It's a great first step in terms of, you know, keeping single use plastics and, and things like that out of the environment. However, seeing as a lot of things that I've seen personally on the side of the road are, are recyclables and, and refundables, um, those aren't gonna be impacted by the ban. So I do think that it might have a small effect on the littering that's happening in our communities, but it, it definitely won't solve the issue. Okay. What do you think it's going to take to change what really is a bad attitude about littering that's passed down from generation to generation to generation? This has been going on for decades. Is it up to public officials? Is it a whole sociological movement that has to happen that people have to take account for their own activities? Uh, you know, who is responsible for making sure that there isn't trash on the streets? I'm really happy that you asked that question because though my petition was to government officials, um, you know, I don't think that they're the sole owners of this issue. In fact, I do think it comes back to the hands of everyone in the community. And, you know, folks learning the impact of throwing out a coffee cup on the side of the road and throwing beer cans on the side of the road. Um, I think more so it is in the hands of the community because those are the folks that are actually doing the littering, right? The, the people who are uh, maybe perhaps not at the governmental level. So I do think that it's something that everybody needs to have a role in. And I'm gonna be optimistic and say that I do think that with, you know, younger generations, being more acclimated to climate change and the effects that littering and uh, environmental contamination and things like that have, you know, it's very popular in today's society and the news and things like that. There's a lot of opportunities for people to become more educated in it. And I do think that into the future, hopefully that will really stick with people and that they'll start to realize that, no, maybe I should just, you know, put this, uh, this coffee cup in my car and then take it in at home and throw it in the garbage. I'm really hopeful that that will, um, some change will be made. Though at the same time, I do think that there needs to be some push and some enforcement to really make people see that their behavior is not allowed. We're winding it down here, Callie. And to help wrap this up, I'm asking you to look into the future. You have asked for concrete solutions from all three levels of government. So let me frame it to you this way. What are you hoping to see the next time you come back to Richmond County, to Isle Madame? Uh, you know, what would you like to see in terms of real concrete, actual courses of action to help clean this all up? So that's a tough question because ideally I would like to see no litter on the side of the road yes. as a result of, you know, um, folks in the community being perhaps, you know, given grants to clean up the existing garbage that's there. Um, I know that this has happened sometimes in the past and that it's getting more challenging now, um, especially with the amount of, of litter on the side of the road. But I would like to see, you know, some, some people out there, not just a few who are taking the initiative, the initiative themselves, but actually like government funded grants that are supporting that. Um, I personally would like to see more enforcement. I would like to see, you know, a law enforcement officer actually practicing the law with somebody who's throwing those large garbage bags out of their car. Um, I don't know how realistic that is, but that's something that I would like to see. And then I would personally like to see some sorts of like educational awareness things out there in the, in the community. So whether that be like a flyer or something on a website from, you know, Richmond County that says, you know, this is the impact of, you know, one coffee cup on the environment. This is how long it takes for it to um, like 
uh, dissolve and all of that information. I just think that there needs to be more out there so that people who, like I said, might not fully understand what the impact is, can have some more information to make it more informed decisions. All right, we've covered a lot of ground in a short time, Callie, and I thought we might, I appreciate that. Do you <laughs> want to add anything else about all of this just before we wrap up? I think that the thing that I would just like to say is, I'm just like anybody else. And all that I did was took, you know, a couple hours to write up a petition, post it online, use my network to help, you know, branch that out, and then looked up some information and in, in laws across the province. So I think that any person could do this. And sometimes it seems like a really large feat to put your time into doing this, but it really could have a lot of impact. And I think that even just my work, um, you know, those few hours that I put in, it really got the conversation started, like, mm. for instance, with with us right now. And so I, I just urge people to take those shots and and take the initiative to do that stuff as well. Well, this is a necessary conversation, and we appreciate you not only sparking that conversation, but taking some time here today to talk with me about it on Telil 24-7. Callie Keogh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much, Adam. Callie Keogh is a former resident of Isle Madam, now working in the Ottawa Office of the Auditor General of Canada. She has been crusading against littering in Isle Madam and Richmond County over the past year. Stay tuned for more of Telil 24-7 in just a moment. And you'll see more of Callie Kehoe later in this edition of Telil 24-7 as she plays our infamous Fast Five game. Right now, I'm coming to you from the Atlantic Ocean side of the St. Peter's Canal with St. Peter's Bay just over my shoulder. This is going to be a busy spot on the first Sunday afternoon of August as a longtime Richmond County event revs up once again after being shut down for two years due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the accompanying social distancing restrictions and gathering limits. Swim the Canal returns in early August as part of Nicholas Denny's Days, the traditional community festival for St. Peter's. So I thought I'd go to the other side of the canal, specifically the Bordeaux Lake side, and meet up with two of the key organizers for this event, Gordon Kerr and Shauna Burke, to talk about their memories of past swims here at the St. Peter's Canal and what they're looking forward to as the event gets going again after a two-year absence. Here's my conversation with Gordon Kerr and Shauna Burke right now. When we moved back here to St. Peter's in, uh, in 24, 2012, uh, 10 years ago, Anne-Marie was lamenting about how nobody was swimming in the canal and they had signs posted, no swimming, because when she grew up, the canal was full of kids and that's where they spent their mm -hmm. summers swimming in the canal. So uh, I ran with that as I sometimes do with her ideas and I convinced Parks Canada to allow us to shut down the canal for the afternoon and get some swimmers to swim from one end to the other and go through the locks. And uh, we went from there. The first year we swam from, from the ocean to the lake and we haven't done that since because the water flows better for opening the locks to going in the opposite direction but I remember hugging Amory when she got out of the water this <laughs> is a good big picture the, the big hug I remember that and I remember there were 75 swimmers it was awesome it was you know so much fun I thought I have to do this. I think it's super cool. Um, and your kids too. And my kids did it that first year. Um, and I think Caitlin was the youngest one that did it. She was eight. And then I remember Mary Jessie Savoy, she was 80. So we have pictures of the two of them, the youngest and the oldest. And then we've done those pictures every year since. They've stayed, you know what I mean? They've done those pictures with their, their number on their arm and, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's kind of been like a family thing that we've just we've done together and like the cotton family they got four generations yep. like mary jesse bobby robbie robbie and and then i think lexi the youngest lexi right has, yeah has been doing it but the saint peter's volunteer fire department has every year uh, provided volunteers for for safety for uh, at the canal 
and we have them along with uh, Nova Scotia Lifeguarders Society. So it's a very safe event. And you can swim with noodles or life jackets or yeah. flippers or goggles, like whatever you need. There's no yeah, restrictions suits, on what you, yeah. yeah. I wore the wetsuit that freezing cold, rainy year. Yeah. Because it was, yeah, it was cold. Mm -hmm. And I hear people are scared of jellies, Adam. It's not, it hasn't been that bad, hey? No. So far every year that we've had it, I've heard a few people say, oh, I'm scared of the jellies, but knock on wood so far, I think it's, we haven't had a bad year. So try to spread out a little bit as best as you can because some of your group is very tough. The water is really turned up and everything. So I'll be care try and be aware and be careful of that. Other than that, have fun. Does anybody have any questions at all though before we get on the bus and get moving? And the bus ride, I have to say, is one of my favorite parts. As an adult, you don't get to go on a school bus very often, but that's one of my favorite parts, going on the bus. And it's a short distance. Yeah. Exactly. We're jammed in the seats together. You feel like you're the only one in the water sometimes, too, when you look up and all those people are cheering for you, but <laughs> they're, you're not, you know what I mean? But you do. It's a rush. Like, there's so many people cheering you on. Usually both sides are full of people. Like, there's hundreds of people here to watch. Um, and then like the music and we all sing. How the Parks Canada involvement starts is that uh, we get a permit from the events coordinator for, for Parks Canada who works out of Bedeck and is responsible for the St. Peter's Canal and, and traditionally there were no events at the St. Peter's Canal so this is really the first one. It's so exciting when those locks open to just go from the, you know, the lake to the ocean is pretty cool. There we go. Temperature drops. I do find it is colder yeah. when that opens up. Yeah. I think it's a rush. I think it's a cool feeling. I've done it every year and I've enjoyed it every year. It's fantastic. Like looking around, everybody's smiling. Everybody's so happy. Usually my girls like to race from when the locks open back to shore. So that's always kind of fun watching them to see which one got there first. There are those hugs when you get out of the water. Like, I don't know. It's to me, it's just, it's a all around great feeling. It is. From the registration statistics in 2019, we saw that 50% of the people were from off island. And they were from all over the place. There was people from, from Europe, from a uh, different a bunch of states in the United States, all across Canada. Um, a lot of people from Quebec and Ontario. There was another thing too in 2019, I think, Nicholas Denny came and swam. Oh, that's from, Yes, from I Alberta. remember that. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And Nicholas Denny, of course, started the trading post here in St. Peter's. Yeah. And we yeah. had the log rollers one year. That was kind of, yeah. that was cool too. I think people definitely missed it and um, I think it's something that we've grown to look forward to every year and then um, I think maybe last year we thought there might have been a possibility that we could have had it but then you know COVID kind of struck up again and you couldn't cram 250 people that close together in the water um, but I think people are super pumped. I've heard lots of people talking about it. I know the uh, online registration is up and going. Gordon said that's filling up pretty quickly. So um, so that's great. I think, yeah, I think people are excited. We've been meeting and we've been making plans and we've got some exciting um, entertainers coming. We've got Roger Stone and Leona Berkey are coming and, uh, and that's going to be quite exciting. We've got Cindy Day. Shauna got Cindy Day lined up to come and, and uh, say a few words so uh, we're pretty pumped we also have some uh, food trucks coming 
this yes. year too. Like we've had food trucks here before, but more food trucks, I guess, this year. And it's also a fundraiser too. Yes, it's a fundraiser for Ukrainian refugees. And uh, we've got a group in, we're c connected with a group in Port Hawkesbury that uh, is doing that. The first year that we did swim the canal, it was a fundraiser to save our lighthouse. But our lighthouse got saved um, in another way. The Coast Guard came in and fixed it up. Nice. So, right on. Yeah. so that was good. And other years, the money has gone into the, the VOCA uh, treasury. And VOCA puts on events to help St. Peter's, like Festival of Trees and... and uh, Nicholas Denny's Nicholas Days. Nicholas Denny's Days. And... There's a winter fest, I think, too, yeah, that they do the in February. Festival. Yep. And, yep. Okay. But this year we're focusing on the Ukrainian refugees. So the online registration is up um, and running. You can go to visitstpeters.com. Yep. Um, and there's a link there to swim the canal. Um, we have a Facebook page, Swim the Canal, and the link is in there as well. Um, Carrie's Custom Cut, you can go there and register or through your wife, Anne Marie, right? Yeah. You could register with her as well. So there's a few ways that you can register. And it's $20 to register, and that gets you a water bottle. And then, like we said, the proceeds will go to the Ukraine families. And we'll have Swim the Canal t-shirts for sale. We yeah. do want you to register sooner than later, though, but... Yeah. So it's unlimited. And if you register on the day, it's $25, not 20 Anne Marie's family members, they're, they're all coming and swim. They come from away wherever they are. It's just great to see them all come. And of course, her brothers and sisters used to swim in the canal themselves. I love looking at the pictures after too, because you're kind of like, you know, the hustle and bustle of everything. You're not really, you know, and then um, some of those photographers capture pictures that I, I'm not even, I didn't even know they were taking, you know what I mean? So it's nice to look at those afterwards. Marilyn um, Proctor and Melissa Carter. Yes, they're amazing. Some Their pictures are photos. amazing. And there was a drone photo one year. Well, you are close together and you're chatting and you're kind of keeping an eye on everyone, make sure things are, you know, going smooth and if anybody needs help. But like when you're all together in the locks, um, you're pretty tight in there and you, you are, you're chatting and you're talking and yeah. Over the past weekend, Nova Scotia Liberal Party members chose their new leader. He's Yarmouth MLA and former Stephen McNeil Cabinet Minister Zach Churchill. I spoke to Churchill just a few months ago during his leadership run, and we thought some of his comments on his plans for the future for both the party and Nova Scotia would be interesting for you to hear at this time. So here, once again, are some comments and some excerpts from my interview with the new leader of the Nova Scotia Liberal Party, Zach Churchill. Joining us now on Talil 24-7 is the MLA for Yarmouth and a leadership candidate for the Nova Scotia Liberal Party. He is Zach Churchill. Thank you very much, Zach, for joining me today. Adam, thanks so much for having me on the program. I really appreciate your time. Well, we wanted to talk to you a bit about your Liberal leadership bid, also about some of the experiences that you've had over the past 12 years serving as the MLA for Yarmouth. But first of all, I wanted to ask you, essentially, it's been a few weeks since you announced, how's your campaign going? How do you feel the reception's been so far? We're having a lot of fun. You know, I've been, I've been in the trenches with the party for uh, 12 years, close to 12 years in elected office, and I was a member of the party in my early 20s, so I'm um, reconnecting with a lot of people, some I haven't seen in a while because of COVID, and we're just trying to build a lot of energy around the party, uh, doing some rebuilding, particularly in rural Nova Scotia, and uh, getting people excited about being involved in, in the campaign, so we want to make sure this is a positive experience for, uh, for everyone involved and for the party. 
So why did you decide to run in the first place? Did you have leadership aspirations before? Or why did you pick now to take a crack at the leadership? I did. I, I certainly wanted to run last time. Uh, I've got a young family. Um, and the last time this came up, uh, my kids were three and one. And I've been watching uh, Stephen during the lockdowns be, be isolated from his community and his family for months at a time. So I didn't feel I could put uh, my wife, Katie, and our kids in, in that position. I certainly didn't want to be uh, locked away from them for, uh, for months. Uh, I was also Minister of Education at the time. And we were uh, trying to get our kids back to school, figure out uh, how we were going to handle COVID and what safety measures we were going to need. So I was dealing with a lot of uh, really critical work. Uh, the most the most important time during my my tenure there, the most critical time, and I felt I needed to see that that work through. So those are the two factors that uh, made me say no last time. Uh, although I did uh, I did I did want to do it. Um, and, and this time it's a different story. You know, we've, uh, I, I don't fear that I'll be, uh, you know, isolated from my family because of lockdowns. And I love the idea of the rebuilding of the party, not just from an organizational perspective, but redefining what we want to do for Nova Scotians and, and what we want to offer people. And so that idea of building a new vision, applying, of course, the lessons uh, of the past during my time in government and previously in opposition to a new exciting and uh, what I hope will be a bold vision for the province is really energizing for me, for sure. You've talked a little bit about your past experience, of course, as Minister of Health. You were also Minister of Education during a very transformative time for the Nova Scotia public school system, also during a very difficult time in terms of labor relations between the provincial government and the Nova Scotia Teachers Union. I wanted to ask you a bit about going through all of this and going through it as a cabinet minister and a high profile, prominent cabinet minister in the Liberal government that had ruled for eight years. Do you feel that's prepared you to take on the leadership mantle because when you compare this to Preston MLA Angela Simmons who seems to be your main competition right now it really is shaping up to be experience versus change so how do you approach that particular dynamic well well certainly I had a lot of experience in in government in making decisions under pressure uh, I have experience with the system of government and I I know how we need to change it as well uh, to improve it so it's better serving people. Uh, so I, I, I certainly think both Angela and I bring different life experiences uh, to the table. She has a really inspiring um, life story as well, and she brings her own own experiences. Uh, and I also want to see some change. So I, I, don't, I don't see it as one or the other. Um, I, I do think being in the pressure cooker of, of politics and in leadership positions and being in government does uh, certainly uh, help me prepare for what changes I want to see uh, implemented, and I know how to implement those changes. So that is uh, something certainly that my professional experience uh, uh, does give me. But uh, it can't be status quo. You know, we we also have to change and improve the system to better meet the needs of people. Um, that goes from our healthcare system to how we support people in need to even how we make decisions. Um, and I'd love to have a chance to get back in government and, and make some more changes there. We, we, we did some good work uh, during our time there. Uh, my time in education was particularly uh, purposeful for me. We did bring in some really big changes like the pre-primary program uh, to Nova Scotia. Uh, that's incredible for families. And my oldest daughter is now in pre-primary. So that's uh, incredibly satisfying to you know see that program fully fully implemented and, and supporting kids and families. And uh, uh, we had, a, I had a great time in, 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 in health too. It was a really intense period, uh, but we, we got to roll out the vaccine program. That was really the envy of the country. And that has helped us uh, get to a position now where we might be able to reopen uh, safely, hopefully, finger, fingers crossed. So very, very meaningful experience that I certainly want to apply to um, to my work as leader, if, if I do get that, uh, if I do get that job.
your campaign seems to be running a tightrope walk between change, but also building on the accomplishments that you just mentioned that the Liberal government's been able to have in terms of education and health. Now, these accomplishments come with the very real nuance that you brought that record as a government into the last election and Nova Scotians as a whole rejected that concept and went with a different party. So what do you say to those folks, uh, particularly in rural Nova Scotia, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of seats that used to be liberal did flip to the PCs. What do you say to them in terms of saying, we are a party you can trust, but also we're different than the party you rejected last August? Well, I, I think the last election was really fought on access to primary health care. And uh, certainly the Conservatives had a very focused campaign on that. They made very big promises to deliver on, on doctors, uh, on more nurses for the province, on 2,500 more long-term care beds. So uh, they, they certainly ran a really strong campaign on an issue that really mattered to rural voters. Uh, I'm a rural representative. Uh, I know the challenges that that our healthcare system faces and that patients face in rural Nova Scotia. Uh, we did, I think, make some very important changes in healthcare. We doubled the amount of nurse practitioners. We expanded the scope of practice for pharmacists that allow them to do prescriptions. We brought virtual care to Nova Scotia. We expanded cancer care. But uh, because of the changing nature of practice with, with family physicians, because of the competitive nature of recruiting those folks uh, and because of labor shortages in the healthcare system, there are, with, with paramedics as well, there, there's real serious big challenges there that you can't fix overnight. So I certainly think that uh, there were some naive promises made by, by the conservatives that they'll have a very hard time uh, following through on. And uh, that's something that we're obviously going to be keeping track of and, and holding them account to was their promises on, on health care, particularly in, in, in rural Nova Scotia. I do, I do hope they, they have successes as, as we did. Um, but in terms of the specific things that they promised, I think they're going to have a very hard time, very hard time delivering on that. So I, I think the last election was really about that, about the, the major pressure of the day. Um, which was, which became over the course of the campaign, access to primary care and ambulatory care. And uh, there's not easy, easy solutions to those, to those challenges, that's for sure. Well, we'll see how things go, both with your party and with Mr. Houston's party in government as the time rolls on. But in the meantime, healthcare, of course, a very important issue for those of us here in the Strait of Canso. And I want to speak to you a little bit because I think you and I would agree there are some similarities between your riding of Yarmouth and some of the ridings up here, Richmond and Inverness as well, uh, Acadian communities in both. So I just wondered, do you have a, an approach to specific issues for the Strait? You've talked a bit about healthcare, but are are there parts of what goes on in the Strait of Cancel that might really resonate with your own campaign? We have that great cultural diversity up, up, in, up in your neck of the woods with the Acadian population, uh, just like we do down here in Yarmouth. So I'm surrounded by Eclair and, and Argyle. They're, my, they're the neighbors of our communities, of our, of our community of Yarmouth. And um, the Acadian population, of course, is very integrated with, with Yarmouth as well. And that presents a really uh, great tourism opportunity to bring people into the area to share our cultural diversity. Rural economic development is absolutely uh, critical. We're seeing the disruption to energy markets right now because of the Russian-Ukraine uh, conflict. We're also seeing the impact to uh, food sources like wheat. You know, Russia and Ukraine are, are among the top 10 producers of wheat uh, in the world. So. Uh, we do have to look at the advantages we have in rural Nova Scotia when it comes to food, um, uh, farming, obviously, and production, as well as, as processing. And I think there's an incredible opportunities considering the, the recent impacts to uh, food distribution uh, for rural Nova Scotia. Uh, and I think we need to take advantage of that, not just for economic reasons, but also for, for food security. Uh, the more food that we're producing here locally, the safer we're going to be when the global supply chains are disrupted. And, and we've seen how fragile those are during COVID. Uh, we saw our supply chains get disrupted. And for the first time, you'd go into a grocery store and there was not, there was, 
you know, no produce on the shelves. That's frightening uh, to see to see that happen so quickly. And now we're seeing the impact of a of a even a regional conflict in, in Eastern Europe uh, potentially have an impact on uh, something as important as wheat supply. So we need to we need to learn from this, and we need to uh, build a plan so we have better food security here. We're producing more, uh, and that's that's also going to help uh, our rural economy uh, as well. Um, access to rural healthcare is 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 a challenge. We have, you know, less healthcare professionals that are going into rural areas to practice. So incentivizing that's really important. Uh, and also, you know, rethinking how we deliver healthcare is really important. You know, we started to expand the scope of practice for nurse practitioners. We doubled the amount that we had in the province. Uh, and we did the same for, for pharmacists. So using uh, all the people we have in our healthcare system, to a, to a broader extent and not bottlenecking everything or relying solely on family doctors, I think is absolutely key to ensuring that people are getting the services they need um, uh, when they need it. And, uh, you know, we started to rethink that and I think did some important work on that, but um, more certainly uh, needs to be done to ensure that even in the most remote parts of our province, people are accessing uh, the care that they need. We are getting ready to wind down the interview, Zach, and I wanted to ask you, we've talked a little bit about your cabinet experiences and what's worked and what hasn't necessarily worked for your party over the last little while. So I wanted to ask you, what is the most important lesson do you feel you've taken away from any of this that will help you should you be given the opportunity to be the Liberal leader and by extension, the Premier of the province. So what's the biggest lesson that you've learned? Well, you have to talk to people that that disagree with you and and try to find some mutual understanding. So even when we were, you know, in the throes of pretty tense labor negotiations with the teachers union, for example, when we were making some changes to the governance of education, uh, that 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 the union wasn't happy with. Uh, I went out and I met with teachers and I talked to them and explained to them the reasons why we were doing what we were doing, and uh, also heard uh, heard what their concerns were and really tried to meet uh, them where they were at. So I mean that that's key to politics. You know, uh, people are going to get upset with you. You have to make uh, decisions that not everybody's going to like. Uh, but the way you discuss those things in public and with people uh, really matter. Um, that said, I mean, one thing I've really learned over the years is that uh, you also have to put your duty uh, to people ahead of what their opinions are of you. So you're never going to be in a situation in politics where everybody's happy with you. You're going to have to make tough calls that are in, uh, in, in, I think the spirit of the, of the greater good, or, or that are the right calls that some people are going to be upset with. And you have to care more about your duty than, than about whether people are going to like you or not. So that's the biggest thing that I've taken away from my experience, um, is, uh, is that this is a, this is a, this is service. And, uh, while you have to find respectable ways to disagree with, with other people. At the end of the day, you still have to make the tough calls that you believe are right. So to wrap things up, I've been asking a number of elected officials this over the last little while. And uh, I think if you're getting ready to run for the leadership of a party and possibly run for the premier's job, this is a good one to ask. What keeps you focused and what keeps you on an even keel as you're going through not only a leadership campaign, but also your day to day duties as an MLA and as the health critic for the opposition party? What keeps you focused and what keeps you level? The uh, evidence and the data and the facts, you know, you really have to keep track of that stuff because there's so much noise around uh, certain issues, whether it's in healthcare, education, or, or the economy. And there's a lot of opinions out there and you really have to, particularly in leadership positions, whether it's leading a department or, or a party, be able to synthesize the information, focus on what's important and make the right decision. Uh, at the end of the day. So, you know, you, you have to work to focus on on um, on what the evidence is, is telling you uh, that you that you need to do. So that certainly helps keep me focused and allows you to deal with some of the, you know, the the more negative parts of the job a little bit better, too. Right. Because you just have to accept people are going to have different opinions. People are going to be um, 
uh, you know, not happy with you at certain points. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, if you can make the right calls for the right reasons and make a difference and have an impact on the lives of people in a positive way, that's, that's, that's really the only thing that matters in this line of work. Zach Churchill, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us on Tell Hill 24-7 today. Adam, this has been great. Thanks so much for the, for the chat. I appreciate it very much. And as usual, we finish up Tell Hill 24-7 with our Fast Five game. Playing this week is anti-littering activist and a former Isle Madame resident, Callie Kehoe, who answered our foolish questions from Ottawa at the Office of Canada's Auditor General. Take a look. Are you all set to play, Callie? I guess I am. <laughs> all right, that's a spirit. All right, let's do it. First question, coffee, tea, or neither? Uh, coffee. How do you take your coffee? Uh, with soy milk. Ah, nicely done. Good, good. Yes. Forward thinking there. I like it. Question number two. I have seen this movie 10 times. I would gladly watch it another 50 times. What is that movie? Hmm. Probably one of the Harry Potter movies. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> there you are. So we'll see Callie heading to a Kidditch match anytime soon. Yes. <laughs> Flying over Almadam. There we are. Yes. Right on. Good. Third question. Dream vacation. I really want to get out to the Rocky Mountains, in fact. So probably somewhere in Alberta. Uh, nicely done. They're beautiful. I can guarantee yeah. you that. So I hope you do get there. Yeah. Question number four. You could be any animal for one day. What is that animal? Definitely a cat because I just love cats. <laughs> oh, marvelous. So you want to get some of that relaxation that the cats have all day. Yeah, lots of sleep. <laughs> uh, uh, there you go. Spoken like someone who works at the Auditor General's office. Right on. <laughs> you could use a little break. And last question on the Fast Five for Kelly Kehoe. Would you rather be a forest or a tree? Mm, a forest. A forest? Why yes. a forest, Kelly? You know, a big collective. There's lots of space to like do your thing. You're not just one lone tree in the forest. So I like that. That was incredibly profound, much more than we <laughs> usually get on this segment. So thank you very much, Callie Keel, for playing the Fast Five with us. Thanks a lot, Adam. And there you have it. That wraps up this week's edition of Tell Ill 24-7. Thank you for tuning in, and a big thank you to my interview guests this week, Shauna Burke, Gordon Kerr, Isaiah Bernard, and Callie Keo. If you have any thoughts about what you've seen over the past hour, or you'd like to make suggestions for a future episode of Tell Ill 24-7, I'd love to hear them. You can contact me directly. You can reach me by phone at 902-625-8863, or send me an email using the address adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also contact a little community television directly with your ideas and your comments. You can reach the station in Arishat by phoning 902-226-1928. And the best email address to use is telil at telil.tv. Don't forget to follow Tell Ill Community Television on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And our YouTube channel features every single edition of Tell Ill 24-7, including this one, as well as individual interviews and stories from our shows and episodes of our sister programs, The Front Porch, Roundtable, and Not Cote. For now, I'm Adam Cook from the beautiful St. Peter's Canal. Thank you once again for tuning in to Talil 24-7. I look forward to seeing you again next week with a brand new show. Bye for now.